Hi volunteers, I'm Amy for those of you who haven't met me yet. Today I will be talking through the latest training material. This video deals with adult learning theories and let's click through the PowerPoint. There we go. So if you'll just bear with me, I'm still getting used to talking to a camera at length, so it might be a bit choppy, but hopefully there's only improvement from then on. So as we go through this material, um, there was a meanwhile question that I had for people, which is just, you know, to be thinking of these things while we, we go through the content. So um, I think as we go through, I'd like you to be thinking how what I'm talking about or examples that other people are bringing up, which I'll try and recall from the class time and say to you. But um, how this applies to your context, I, whether you're a one-on-one -on -one tutor or in a classroom setting um, or even just in your own learning experience, right? Maybe even throughout this video because you are an adult and you ideally would be watching this to learn something. So I guess I could just read off the slide how this applies to confirms or conflicts with your experiences with your students in classes as well as with your own experiences as, like we said, adults. So. So this is just an overview of what we'll go go over, what we'll cover. Um, so we open with a discussion on characteristics and possible motivations for adult learners. Um, then we talked about andragogy, which is a specific set of principles and or theories uh, put out by Malcolm Knowles. And then we ran through transformative learning, which is a bit more of a holistic and interactive framework for learning. And then we had a discussion and a scenario from um, some articles. So, <sighs> oh, I need to move my face out of the way. I just learned I could do this. There we go. So here we have a illustration of a common adage that I hear in the education field is um, the teacher being portrayed as a sage on the stage, right? And that's the more traditional model of education and teaching, having like one person monologuing, kind of like I am now, um, just with, I can pretend maybe I should draw like a smiley face and stick it on a post-it on top of my computer, I don't know. Um, anyway, so you have one person speaking in front of an audience. So a sage on the stage versus being a guide on the side. And that is a facilitative role and kind of guiding learners to their own um, conclusions and helping them catch their own errors and mistakes, right? So that, again, that's having a sage on the stage versus a guide on the side. So just be thinking about that comparison. And I'm not trying to say one is better than the other. Um, some people have stronger opinions, but um, but just learning to be aware of both and when a certain style may be more appropriate and when, you know, another one may benefit learners more. So, okay, so we, this is the discussion about characteristics of adult learners and just to get people thinking and aware of situations students might be coming in from. So, um, we went through and like, this had a cool transition where when I clicked it, like a new question would pop up. So um, just a lot of people have students that are older than them or students that have multiple jobs, be, be, uh, who speak more languages than the teacher or facilitator, uh, students who have lots of responsibilities uh, family-wise, like taking care of both generations um, on either side of them, uh, students who have more formal education than a lot of us, um, students who maybe have their first language in a different script. So we'll get into uh, language distance a bit later. That's actually in the language acquisition uh, portion, which is will be a separate video. Um, and then students who may be illiterate in their first language, which is some, it's sometimes difficult to place that. And um, sometimes students have family still in their home country or uh, um, kind of like a transition country, right? So it depends on how they're fleeing if they're refugees. Um, so just, again, to get you thinking about what situations and contexts your learners are coming from, so that can hopefully help inform instruction and responsive and responsible teaching practices and or tutoring practices. So, so motivation. Uh, this was a also a discussion where the 
little bullet points popped up as I clicked and that was fun, but um, we're not in that slideshow function actually right now. Like I could edit it if I wanted to. So, um, so motivation and we just went around and brainstorming like, why would you want to attend a class? Why would, you know, if, um, and so uh, great points people brought up were, you know, having a sense of community, right? If you're new here, you may, like a lot of students had trouble finding jobs after COVID hit. So, you know, class was really maybe their only time to get to know other people or, um, so, and a lot of what the people uh, brought up in discussion was then, sorry, when I point to the screen, it, you can't actually tell. So I need to remember to point with my pointer. Um, so a lot of this was covered in the discussion. And so um, as you're uh, just watching through this video, um, take a moment to think on uh, more explicit motivations that you may be aware of in your students and the ones they tell you, but then also maybe what you what you see versus um, like actions versus words, right? So like some students may be very highly motivated um, and have the best of intentions, but they may have like a lot of caretaker duties or like two or three jobs and their attendance just isn't great. Or if it is, if they can make it, are they actually engaged versus, you know, and so that's, um, that's difficult because they're very legitimate reasons to um, kind of step out of that virtual class session. Um, but yeah, so just be thinking on that and um, teaching implications. So, and or instruction. When I say teaching, I know a lot of you are volunteers. So, it it encompasses you know facilitator and tutor and you know like friend as well. So, and so this is getting into the first theory. This is Andrew Goji, um, and I'll just read through my bullet points actually for simplicity's sake. After I move my face a little bit, so. Uh, the term was popularized by Malcolm Knowles in the late 60s, and then he kept coming out with more um, research as it began to gain traction. So, but the actual first recorded use of this term as like, you know, a name for something um, was by a German educator named Alexander Kopp. So, um, and then it comes from the term, uh, or like etymologically, it comes from Greek, and it just means leader of men, whereas um, pedagogy, which is a term we should all be maybe more familiar with, you know, is leader of children. Um, and it's based on the premises that uh, adults learn differently than children, you know, like adults aren't just big kids. I mean, some of them are, and that's fun. Um, sorry, that's not nice. Um, they learn differently because they have different experiences and uh, mental capacities and functions, right? Um, and so this may seem like duh to us, but uh, at the time it wasn't really a, a big thought in the world. It, um, but it was revolutionary, revolutionary uh, at the time. Sorry, I should just stick to my slides. So, all right. All right, so Andrew Goji, consists of six main principles and we'll just run through these it is one the learners need to know so adults it's very important for them to understand why they're learning what they're learning and a lot of times they've signed themselves up for this or that class so they they know the why and it, it just we need to kind of help fulfill it then as their uh teachers and those who have taken on the responsibility of instructing so um but also it helps them to sometimes know like what do they risk or how is their what's the risk of not knowing it? how can their life be better by knowing it how is it worse if they don't know it and um so that's getting kind of getting at motivations and helping students understand that it's not meant to be like one of those marketing tricks of like oh your life will be so terrible without like english 2.0 with this textbook right and we're not trying to sell them anything um like monetarily. So, uh, okay, so self concept. Adults tend to come in with a more solidified concept of self. Uh, that is, they are used to making hard choices. They kind of have had their place in the world. Whether or not it's been uprooted is uh, very student by student, and we'll get more into that later. Um, they're used to having agency and choice and responsibility. And so, um, I think the example I used in the session was um, 
it may or may not be useful to have stickers uh, for writing assignments or like little, uh, so, you know, don't be patronizing. But that was difficult for me because I personally love stickers. Um, but yeah, so just being aware of how you come off and you don't want to be uh, patronizing because odds are they get patronized a lot in their place of work for being a non-native English speaker or just, and like even people with the best of intentions, they can come off as, um, you know, patronizing. And we want to be more mindful of that and not perpetuate that. So, and I'm sure a lot of you are like, don't, are very aware of this and don't do that. So, but um, yeah, just to help get us on the same page and have all the um, possible, you know, pros and cons and, okay. So prior experience, um, adults come with, and this is in the realm of education, but also life experience. So adults can come to the table with um, different, orientations to learning based on prior learning experience. And this can be uh, very heavily influenced by culture and or um, society, right? And so one thing that we talk about is the power distance index. And so in cultures where power is, figures in power are further removed um, from, you know, like the the normal people, I guess, for lack of a better term. I'm afraid to use a big word because I'd use it wrong. Um, anyway, so in more authoritarian cultures, teachers are seen with more, more power. And so students uh, often don't question or it seems wrong to question a teacher or even be in dialogue with them. And so this is reflected in a more traditional, like, uh, I want to say pedagogical approach, but that's not true. Um, so like that more traditional sage on the stage approach. And um, so that's an example of a different orientation to learning based on prior experience. Um, but then we also have to take into account life experience, um, which is one, adults come to the table with a wider, deeper variety of life experience. And we can... Um, with respect to confidentiality and um, just general sensitivity, because some of the, our students have been through really tough things. Um, but we can draw on those experiences. We refer to that as having funds of knowledge. So you may have someone who, you know, was a lawyer in their home country and they can talk about um, things that you as the facilitator may not know and add to the content of the class. So it's getting students to um, engage and talk about um, life together and in a way that one builds community and relationship but also they can see each other as resources as well so um, readiness to learn understanding that roles in life require learning so so we talked about how adult students come to the table with you know prior experience of being this person or that person, right? So like a parent, a teacher, a lawyer, a doctor, uh, you know. Um, and so they understand that taking on different roles sometimes requires taking that initiative to learn something new about it. The example is, um, you know, signing up for a parenting class if you learn that you're expecting and you're a new couple. Or we also have, what's it called? foster like if you want to be a foster parent there are mandated courses you have to go through right to prepare for that so um, that's a good example that's yeah not an ESL example specifically so uh, orientation to learning and we've touched on this in a couple different uh, realms but uh, adults tend to come very driven and I want to solve a specific problem with the knowledge I will gain from this so um, they need practical and applicable um, examples and um, situations to work through in class because that one helps engage them with the content and um, help them help the learning process kind of solidify and then motivation to learn the last one adults typically have internal structures to intrinsically motivate themselves uh, with kids you know like stickers tend to work um, words of praise which you should always be you know positively affirmed well, sorry not always because you don't want to devalue it by overusing it i think you get what i'm trying to say though because you're adults and i trust that you have prior experience to um understand through my 
um, tangents. So we are going to move to the next slide. All right, so here's a simplified version. This is from a YouTube video that I will um, Try and link in the description, but I'm still working on how to do that, so I will try my very best. But this is from a woman named Linda, and she, I think she does adult trading, professional development for like corp corporations, right? So she gives us a nice acronym about PI, which is always fun. And um, so adults need application and so you give them practice in the classroom if you can and language learning this you know could look like i think i was observing and they the health and the health and uh medicine unit recently i don't actually know the name of it embarrassingly enough but uh real practice looked like calling up uh the local emergency room or doctor's office and going through the um the the recorded menu and so the students listened to it over and over. And I believe this was a higher level class. I forget which one, but that was a really cool authentic activity that gave them practice. Uh, problem solving. So it all think problem solving, we give them scenarios to work through and talk through. Um, this can be the dialogues in the textbooks that we have. Um, or asking them, you know, like if you were in so-and-so situation, like a reading comprehension question almost, um, you know, if you were a character in the story, how would you want to be treated? What would you do next? So getting them kind of doing perspective taking activities because that engages more parts of the brain. It also can tend to uh, engage the social brain as well. So uh, involvement, adults need involvement. So you give them activities and then adults need experience. So we give them discussions so that the idea is they can learn from one another's experiences as well. And being able to or having to think about your own experience and then having to put it into words and articulate it to other people in a way that they will understand um, is also good for kind of condensing and organizing thoughts. So it is another mode of learning. So, <clears throat> and then if you have any examples from your experience with students, be thinking about what these look like, what giving adults practice or scenarios or activities or discussions, thinking about what that looks like um, in your context specifically. So, and then this is a little, a little blah, okay. I'll be right back. So this is a little note about andragogy versus pedagogy, right? So teaching adults versus children. And it's also, a uh, bit of a disclaimer that the claims that we've been making about adults and adult, adult learning about being problem solvers and critical thinkers and, you know, having motivation, these aren't statements meant to specifically and exclusively apply to adults. And we're not saying kids can't problem solve, kids don't like activities, because obviously they can do these things and they do like these things. And there's actually talk out in the, you know, like, we write academic articles, so students have to buy our textbooks, right? That um, academia, whatever. Um, and they're like, no, like the principles of andragogy could really just be re repurposed as principles of good teaching. But you know, with everything, there's no definitive answer in that in that realm because people need to write their PhDs and debate. So, uh, anyways, this is I like to move my face again. Hold on, maybe up here. Well. Anyways, I like this little chart. It's the direction of information and relationship. Typically in traditional pedagogy, there's the sage on the stage here. Excuse me, I just chugged a lot of water. Um, and then notice the directional arrow is one direction of information to, you know, learners that are kind of next to each other, but they're kind of, you know, like in parallel, but they're not necessarily interacting versus in andragogy, you definitely have the, um, it's not really a guide on the side, but he's like the center of the wheel in this one. So there's a two-way directional flow of information, but it also goes between students. So again, that's the more collaborative, um, I don't know a good way, way to put my face somewhere. I don't know what's on the next slide. So anyways, um, also a bonus term I learned while researching all of this was called hudagoji. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but... Um, it refers to the study of self-directed learning, which is interesting. And apparently it's kind of taken off in the era of COVID because it's a field of study used to design online learning environments. So, ah, there we go. Okay, so this is more information on 
um, pedagogy versus andragogy broken down by certain categories. And so this is from uh, the Summer Institute of Linguistics and on the handout, which I have here, but it's also will be attached in the email I send you to give you the link to this video is how I'm going to do it, I think. Uh, anyways, you'll get a copy of this chart with more uh, information. So if you're curious on the compare and contrast, because I know a decent amount of our volunteers come from an educational background and or have had children and or grandchildren. Um, so sometimes comparing the two is helpful. So, all right. I really should standardize my slides and where I can keep my face for recording. I'm sorry. Thank you for bearing with me. Sorry. All right, so transformative learning is the second framework we're going to talk through. It's put out by a researcher, scholar person named Jack Mesero. And so this is especially relevant to adult learning principles because it's based on adults not relying on their previously established funds of knowledge, that is their life experiences, you know, um, when they're learning something new, but instead using critical reflection and analysis to transform their learning and understanding. So the idea is that, yes, adults have experience, but then when they experience something new to learn it, it kind of is, Sorry, I had better words a minute ago. Learning happens from the tension that arises between knowing what you know and then realizing there's new information incoming that you don't know. And so that tension, that friction between the known and the unknown should kind of be harnessed to grab attention and direct focus to learn the new whatever it is. So there's 10 steps here. Gosh, I have to move my face again. There we go. All right, I'll keep that in mind for the next time I make a PowerPoint, I think. Um, it's probably not a big deal, but kind of throws me out of my um, talking groove. Anyways, thanks for sticking with me again. Um, so this is the cyclical, the cyclical cycle of transformative learning. That should be a very technical term, right? Um, so you have that disorienting dilemma, like realizing you don't know something, examining yourself and or your knowledge of figure out where the gap is. Um, critical assessment of, you know, good or bad, how much do I not know, am I, you know, dying without knowing it, um, recognizing, if you do choose to recognize, you're like, okay, maybe I do need to choose, maybe I do need to change and learn this, um, and exploration, planning a course of action, acquisition of the knowledge, provisional trying on of roles, uh, building of competence and self-confidence, and then reintegrating into the new role. So again, you can see how this is learning integrated with um, application, right? Because it specifically talks about how can the learning help you in your role, whatever that may be. And so the question I had posed was, in what ways does our work with our students fit into one or many of these phases? Um, some answers that came out were um, self-examination and or critical assessment. You can have writing prompts for students that are, you know, student-centered, um, not necessarily, you know, if you have, again, like it, read a story and you ask the students, you know, what would you do in this situation or how does this, like, is this similar to anything you've experienced versus, you know, what did so-and-so character do, right? They're trying to think as themselves, not necessarily in the place of the character. So again, that's perspective taking, um, but it, uh, student-centered way. So um, another one that I remember we had mentioned was the building of competence and confidence with the students in their jobs for those that uh, work outside the home or even those who work inside the home because the whole family would be uh, in transition or has been in transition. So um, but specifically building of competence and confidence in a job setting where everybody else is speaking English. Um, a lot of students want to be able to pronounce things better. They want to lose their accent or at least be, um, excuse me, intelligible. But also in um, hearing, listening, um, listening comprehension, because a lot of them, you know, um, they want to know what's being said at work. They want to know what everyone's laughing at and they're pretty sure it's not them, but they can't be sure, right? So just helping them build that um, in social situations. So 
actually, I'm going to pause here and start a new video because this is getting kind of long. So.